Uh, welcome, everybody. This is uh, Decouple Drupal uh, and Ember. Um, and uh, uh, once again, this is a session that replaced uh, the old session this time slot. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, my name is Preston Kedmina uh, Falcha uh, here in Dublin. Um, I work at Acquia. I'm part of the office of the CTO. Uh, where I work on uh, uh, Drupal itself, as well as other open source initiatives. You might have heard of Waterwheel, uh, which is a um, SDK ecosystem that I've been working with. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what Ember is, um, what Decoupled Drupal is. I'm, how many people have heard of Headless Drupal, Decoupled Drupal? Pretty much everybody. Okay, good. So I'm going to gloss over some of the uh, uh, sort of setup a little bit in terms of uh, you know, what decoupled Drupal is, just because you know, pretty much all of us know what exactly we're talking about. I want to delve into Ember architecture. Uh, what exactly, uh, um, you know, does uh, an Ember app look like? Um, talking about setting up Drupal. Um, how do we get Drupal to talk to Ember? Um, writing an Ember application that talks to, talks to Drupal on the front end. Um, and then finally, a little bit of a discussion or a little bit of a sort of uh, rumination on um, what the future might hold. As you may recall from the keynote yesterday, uh, Dries uh, mentioned, it was a bit of a surprise, actually. He mentioned that his uh, favorite uh, framework, uh, at least the one that he's been looking at uh, for community reasons, is uh, Ember. So anyways, uh, what is Decouple Drupal, just as a little bit of quick background. Uh, well, decoupled Drupal is the use of Drupal as a data provider or a service provider. Uh, using a RESTful API, um, although there are other solutions available, like GraphQL, which you'll hear about tomorrow. There's uh, two types of architectures that use this kind of approach. There's fully decoupled Drupal and progressively decoupled Drupal. I've got plenty of uh, content in the past about this uh, if you're interested in learning more. Uh, there's obviously some risks of decoupled Drupal, which I do want to highlight here and make sure that you're aware of. Um, but there are also some pretty big advantages, uh, namely the fact that you can build applications that are fully decoupled, like Ember. Um, so in Drupal 8, we have uh, Core REST, uh, the Whiskey initiative, uh, Web Services and Context Core, uh, allowed for web services to be in Core. And um, you know, Views also supports REST export natively. Um, and there's also a module called Relaxed, which you will hear about most likely this week, uh, which works uh, really well with offline enabled applications. But today, we're going to be talking about JSON API. Um, how many people have heard of JSON API as a specification? OK, cool. So JSON API is a specification that has really gained a lot of steam in the last 12 to 24 months. And the reason why is because uh, a lot of people in the Rails community and a lot of people in the Ember community have uh, uh, really sort of worked a lot with JSON API. Um, its tagline is really to be an anti-bike shedding tool. Um, and it's really been very popular um, you know, quite uh, in, the, in the last couple of years. And actually, the really compelling thing about JSON API is that Ember, by default, integrates with JSON API. And also, if you were in the JSON API session that just happened this morning, uh, you might have heard uh, from Matteo, um, who, who spoke about JSON API and some of the features there. And we now have a, a, a very robust um, JSON API module in Drupal. All right, so what is Ember? Well, um, you know, you might have heard of Ember as being alongside these, you know, two other frameworks, Angular and React. But the history of Ember actually goes back a really long ways. Uh, Ember is the successor of the Sprout Core project, uh, which was an application framework, but also a widget library. And uh, basically, what happened was the Sprout Core project actually split into an application framework on its own and a set of widgets. Ember is the successor of that application framework. So. Um, some of the design principles that Ember follows are uh, a focus on ambitious web applications, uh, more productive out of the box, which means more sort of a, 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 a more guided approach. I remember when I first started uh, doing these presentations, my first React application actually was a total disaster um, because it's really hard to kind of get your bearings around exactly how to build uh, a React application the right way. Ember makes it very easy because it's very opinionated. It values convention over configuration, which is one of the big uh, mantras of the Rails community. And uh, you know, it really focuses on making sure that things are stable while maintaining that foresight into uh, future web standards. Ember has a large footprint. Uh, and that's something that you might have heard of, is that it's got quite a, a, a large code size. It's very opinionated, which means that it's not so ideal for more small-scale applications or application components that you might want to stick into your Drupal site interpolated in an interpolated fashion. 
Um, but the Ember framework is also not managed by corporate giants, right? Unlike Angular and React, which are managed by Google and uh, Google and Facebook, res uh, respectively. And Ember's real sort of uh, aim and mission is to focus on making web applications as close to native applications in their user experience as possible. So some drawbacks of React, as I mentioned, are that it's opinionated, large file size, and of course, um, you know, Ember applications that are in uh, uh, 1.0 will not work uh, uh, in, in the present version, which is 2.0. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Ember's architecture, and then we'll, di we'll dive into some code. Um, so in Ember, application state is represented by routes, which is pretty common uh, among these application frameworks. Uh, and it has a respective uh, route object that controls what the user sees. Um, there's a lot of ways in which you can set the URL in Ember. Um, you, know, you can either modify the URL, you can you know, have the uh, index route, which is when you boot the app for the first time. Um, and then uh, you know, obviously you have events in the application that modify the route or someone clicks on a link. Uh, there's also route handlers in Ember, uh, which is probably a familiar concept to many of you, uh, which is uh, you know, a way to render templates and load data models. And we'll talk much more about that very soon. Uh, Ember templates do use handlebars, uh, which is actually quite similar in a lot of ways to Twig. There are some uh, substantial differences. Uh, but um, you know, these templates are, are very powerful, and you'll see what they look like very soon. Um, Ember models, uh, so uh, Ember has this, uh, 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 this kind of framework called Ember Data, which handles uh, persistent data, uh, which means that you, know, you can have client-side storage of this data uh, that can be persisted to a web server. Uh, but they can also save to anywhere else, like local storage and what have you. Uh, there's also components. You know, one of the things that uh, you know, has really become a trend in JavaScript frameworks these days is uh, nestable, reusable components. And Ember is a very component-driven uh, architecture. Uh, and uh, the thing is, though, Ember on its own is kind of uh, you know, something that is really good. But actually, unlike React and unlike some of the other tools you might have used, um, Ember actually has a much larger surrounding ecosystem. Uh, there's a CLI, a command line interface, called Ember CLI, which you can use uh, to build your Ember applications very quickly. Um, and there's also things like uh, Ember, um, uh, Ember Data, of course, um, as well as Ember Inspector, which is a Chrome extension uh, that you can use to debug your Ember applications. Um, so here's just a couple of examples. Uh, Ember Fastboot, for instance, does server-side pre-rendering for uh, applications that need to have uh, that initial server-side render. Um, also, if you saw the uh, session by Ed Faulkner at DrupalCon New Orleans uh, that demoed some of the features of Ember, um, he was using a library called Liquid Fire, which is uh, an, uh, an animation plugin uh, for Ember. So Ember CLI is uh, basically a tool that allows you to generate these things very quickly. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things that Ember CLI comes with. Um, and I want to sort of jump into code a little bit, so I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly. Uh, Ember data, in short, maps client-side models to server-side data, which means that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, your models on the client side and the data that's available from the server side. Um, if you're going to be following along with me as I uh, attempt to uh, write an application live, um, I, highly re I highly recommend that you download uh, Ember Inspector um, because it's a very, very powerful tool. And um, you know, it's very similar to things like, um, like, like, uh, like Batarang for, for Angular um, or some of the other debug tools that are out there. Um, obviously, there are some other tools in the stack, as I mentioned. All right, so let's talk about setting up Drupal. Um, and this is something that uh, you know, is, is very important because we're not actually going to be using Core REST. Um, JSON API does build on top of Core REST, but we're not going to be using the Core REST API as you might know it uh, traditionally. Um, by the way, this is uh, Drupal 8.2. So what I'm going to do is uh, you know, I've got my, um, my Drupal site already set up. right? And what you want to do is you want to get the most recent version off of uh, Drupal.org, uh, um, off of the GitHub, uh, if you so choose. And obviously, you want to run Composer install, as you normally do. Um, you can set up a Drupal site locally using Acquia Dev Desktop, and that's something I've done here, actually, which is uh, just set up a, a quick local site um, using uh, Acquia Dev Desktop. So um, just to show you very quickly what that looks like, um, here's my site. And uh, as you can see, it's a pretty standard Drupal site. Um, now, one of the things that you'll want to do is to install Drupal, of course, um, and set up some dependencies that will help us get going really quickly. Uh, so if you know Drush 
and you're able to uh, very quickly generate um, some content. Um, one of the things that Drush uh, has, which is a really great feature, is the ability to generate content, generate uh, taxonomy terms, and generate users very quickly using this shorthand that you can see. Um, so I highly recommend that, uh, that you get that set up. And um, you know, one of the other things that we'll also need is JSON API. Um, and JSON API will give you all of the things that you need uh, to actually use Drupal as an Ember-optimized backend. Um, and JSON API actually adds a new format, which is called uh, API JSON. Alrighty, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and move a little forward here. So one of the things that's changed in 8.2 compared to 8.1 um, is that uh, REST is no longer configured um, in the uh, rest.settings.yaml file. It's actually now configured through configuration entities. Um, which means that it's much more uh, sort of close to the spirit of Drupal 8's config entity system. Um, and so there's actually an example available within the REST module that you can use uh, as a template. And what you'll see when you open this up, if you have a, a, a sort of vanilla installation of Drupal already handy, is you'll see this. You'll see a YAML file which has a whole bunch of, of stuff. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, Drupal is aware of the fact that we're going to be using a new format called JSON API. And if you look, you can see we've got formats, um, API underscore JSON, and we're also dealing with nodes. So all of these nodes are going to be available to uh, uh, JSON API, sorry, uh, available, uh, exposed in the JSON API format. We want to do the same thing as well with uh, users, uh, because ultimately what we want to do here, uh, at the end of this presentation, I would really love to get uh, us to build um, an application that uh, begins to broach the kind of um, you know crud applications that you see often. Um, we're going to do uh, read. Uh, we're going to read content entities through this Ember application, and we're going to also begin to scratch the surface of creating them as well. Um, we're not going to necessarily have time, I think, for uh, deleting and updating them. Um, so, one of the things that you'll notice now is that if you've gone through all of these steps and if you've uh, uh, managed to you know, import these configurations, and I'll show you actually where that screen is, just so you see it. Um, oh, whoops, uh, let's see here, here we go. So this screen right here is uh, you know, one of the ways that you can import configuration entities into Drupal. Um, and so if you paste what I just showed you into this field and submit, you can, oh, oh sorry, yep, absolutely. Is that better? Um, so that way you can, you can see uh, uh, you know, all of these uh, things. And um, let me go back so you can see the URL again in case, oops, in case you would like to uh, note that down. I'll have these slides available as well uh, at the end. So um, now what you might notice is how many people have worked with Core REST before? So if, you, if you've worked with Core REST before, one of the things that is really distinct about Core REST is that um, you know, when you make uh, get queries against uh, core REST, you're not using a namespace usually unless you declare one yourself, unless you define one yourself. JSON API actually assumes that you do this. And, um, you know, what you'll notice is that all of these uh, sort of um, uh, uh, um, endpoints that you see here are actually very different from those in core REST. But what you'll notice is that when I go over and I look at exactly what those look like, You'll, you'll notice that I've got all of my data here in a nice formatted JSON uh, output here. And as you can see, one of the nice things about JSON API is that it gives it to me in a nice array, which means that um, I can call all of them at the same time. So that's very useful. One of the last things I want to note is that if you're building a fully decoupled application uh, with Ember, you want to make sure to set up cross-origin resource sharing. Uh, because if not, you're not going to be able to access uh, the Drupal data through your uh, Ember application. Um, there's opt-in core support in Drupal 8.2. Um, I like to use uh, Sally Young's uh, uh, cores module, which is a really powerful tool. Um, and if you go into the UI, you'll see that there's uh, a field for you to uh, insert you know, what uh, um, you know, what is available, what paths on the site are available to this decoupled application, as well as what that uh, uh, path is. So just to show you what that is, just so, uh, you know, for completeness' sake, 
Uh, if you go to configuration and you scroll down to cores, you'll notice that I've already got um, my domain inserted there. And I've already put in localhost with the port 4200 because that is where our Ember application is going to be located. All righty, so don't forget to clear cache, obviously, after you've done all of this setup and, and gotten things going just in case. All right, how's everybody feeling? Good, good, all right, cool. Are you ready to get into Ember? Yeah? yeah? All right, cool. Um, so, writing an Ember application. Uh, let's talk about setting up Ember. Uh, one of the things that's really nice about Ember is the CLI. The command line interface is really sweet. It gives you a whole lot of really nice functionality. And I'm going to actually show you what that looks like right now. Um, so what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to actually exit out. And let me zoom way in here so you can see this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and get out of here and create a new project. Um, and I'm going to call it, uh, let's call it um, Ember Aklia, which is the, uh, the Gaelic name for Dublin. Now, if we go into this project, what you'll notice is that you know, we want to go ahead and install uh, a new Ember application. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to use the Ember CLI and use Ember commands with arguments to actually give us a really nice um, Ember application. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do Ember new. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. This is, uh, I should do, what I should do is this. I should use, so what, what, what this will do actually is this Ember command will actually create a new directory for you right, right away. So if I'm going to call my application this, what you'll see is that Ember's going to generate all of these things and download all these packages. Um, and all of these things are going to come through. And once they come through, yeah, you'll see a lot of uh, um, really cool stuff happen. So while this is going, any questions really quickly about uh, setting up Drupal with JSON API, questions about JSON API itself um, while I get going here? All righty. Any questions about Drupal on the back end side? Any questions about me? Yes? Are you doing this from a pre-built? No. So um, yes, so that's a good question. Um, you know, normally, a lot of people uh, would do the progressively decoupled route, which is where you interpolate uh, a JavaScript framework into an existing Drupal site. What we're doing here is we're going to be using, we're going to be going more in the fully decoupled direction. And the reason why is because uh, one of the things that's really unique about Ember is that um, it's really optimized for full page applications. You know, whereas applications like React, or sorry, uh, frameworks like React, uh, frameworks like Angular are uh, somewhat more well suited, let's say, to using uh, uh, those frameworks in very sort of limited. Uh, components. You can use Ember in a progressively decoupled setting, and actually there are examples of that, and I'll show you that uh, towards the end here. Um, but uh, that is one of the things that uh, you know is flexible about these frameworks is you can do sort of you know either direction. This is not happening at the theme level though. I've got two separate domains, one of which is my Drupal site, and one of which is my uh, Ember server. So I've got this going now, and now let me go ins go ahead and get inside here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and boot up this application. And it's as simple as saying Ember server. And as you can see, what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to get a uh, very nice uh, little message that says, hey, go to this port. And if I open up a new tab, what you'll see is a very friendly uh, Tomster, which is the mascot of Ember, saying, congratulations, you made it. We're done. We're done. All right. It's, it's, <laughs> Presentation's over. No, just kidding. Um, we've got a long ways to go before we can get uh, stuff going here. So the next step, of course, is for us to go ahead and begin to do some generation of the components that we'll need for this application. One of the things that, em that Ember does really well is the idea of making things as easy as possible for you to get going quickly, which means that if I want to go ahead and really quickly get my application template, all I have to do is type Ember generate template application. And what that'll do is that'll give me uh, an initial template, right? So if I go ahead and open up a new window in Atom with this directory in place, right? And I go ahead and zoom in here, uh, right? And I go ahead and open up my app. No, that doesn't zoom in. But if I open up my template and I open this up, right? What you'll see is you'll see this very empty looking thing here which doesn't really have anything, but it's given me already the scaffolding for my application on the left side here. 
And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just give a little bit of a you know, thing that you can see here. So I'm going to call this Dublin Ember, and I'm going to type outlet. Now, outlet is a very important concept in Ember. What outlet does is that if you have templates, and you know that you're going to have templates that are nested within those templates, outlet is where those templates that are nested within will fall. Now, I'm going to save this, and if I go back, you'll see that, oh, I need to start my server again. Once I start my server again, if I reload this, you'll see that the, um, my uh, uh, welcome message has been replaced by some HTML. So, OK, all good to go. But we've got a lot more work to do because we've, you know, ultimately what we want to do is we want to get Drupal data to show up on this screen. And the way we're going to do that is to go ahead and generate a, a route. And a route is one of the sort of quintessential units of Ember. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the shorthand. You can do Ember G, which is a shorthand. I'm going to say articles, because one of the things I want to do first is get a list of articles from Drupal. Now, if I go ahead and just say that, what you'll see is it's created uh, a route JS file. It's created the handlebars template that I'm going to need. Uh, it's created the route to the, it's added the route to the router. And then finally, it's created a test. Uh, I'm not going to be covering tests today. But um, what you'll see now is if I go in here, I've got all of a sudden this additional template that just showed up magically. And all I had to do was type one command. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and replace this just with some you know, filler text. Let's just say list of articles. Now if I save that and I go ahead and uh, restart my server, what you'll see is that the outlet concept makes sense. right? Because if I go back to my browser and I refresh, you've got this home page. When I navigate to the route, you'll see that I have the header, which is the main template. And underneath that template, I now have an additional header from my articles route. Does that make sense? All righty. Now, the other important concept here is that now I need to give it some data. But the thing is, I'm not quite ready to connect this to Drupal quite yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open up one of these routes. And as you can see, uh, Ember uh, makes a very strong use of ES6. ES6 is the sort of emerging new standard of JavaScript. Um, you know, it uses uh, ES6 modules. It uses ES6, um, you, know, you know, things of that nature. And I'll actually show you some syntax that you might find unfamiliar. How many people have written ES6? Uh, OK, wow, awesome. This is good then. Uh, but JavaScript people have written, right? OK, good. All right, <laughs> just checking. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and provide a model to this route. What that means is that I have now a template right, for my route. I have my articles page. But I don't have anything that's on there. I don't have any data there. right? I need to provide it some data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do this. And what you'll notice is that this might be unfamiliar to you because this syntax is actually the same thing as saying this in uh, regular JavaScript. Uh, ES6 has actually gotten away, uh, uh, has actually uh, gotten rid of the need to do this, and you no longer need to have an additional anonymous function uh, when you declare a method like this. What this is called is it's called a model hook, and model hooks in Ember are very important because anytime you have a route, the model hook is going to be what provides the data to that route. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to provide just some you know some filler data here. So I'm going to go ahead and say article number one. Article number two, and article number three. And as you can see, I've just created an array within uh, JavaScript, which is just going to give me uh, just a little set of data that I can work with. Right. Now, the next thing that I want to do is to talk a little bit about components. Components, as I mentioned before, are nestable, reusable uh, items that you can put into templates. Right. And what you'll see is if I go ahead and I exit out of my server, shut down my server, and I generate a component. And in this case, I'm going to call it entity list. Now, I do want to make a couple of notes here. Ember components, by rule, must have a hyphen. And the reason why is because the HTML uh, custom elements uh, um, standard states that all custom elements must be namespaced with a hyphen as well. So that's one of the ways that Ember is forward-looking and anticipating the, the, the trends of where HTML is headed. I've called it entity list 
because we're not just talking about uh, nodes here. We're talking about content entities in general. As you may know, in Drupal 8, REST, you are able to perform crud operations on all content entities, which means article, which means uh, nodes, users, and taxonomy terms. So I called it entity list because I want it to be something generic. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back, and as you can see, already I've got an additional uh, components file here. If I open that up, once again, I've got this shell. And this is the really powerful thing about Ember CLI. It gives you this nice shell that you can really quickly work with. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use um, the components template over here. And I'm gonna go ahead and put in some information. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, you know, if I go back to my articles template, you can see that I've got my list of articles here, right? And what I'm gonna do very quickly just to show you what's happening here is I'm gonna give, I'm gonna put in a loop here. And what this does is it gives you uh, each of the articles in that list. Oh, come on, Adam. You know, sometimes Adam is great, sometimes it's not so great. Um, and just bear with me here, because what you'll see once I reboot the server is, let me go back to the previous screen here. And what you'll see is when I actually navigate to uh, slash articles, you'll see that that array that I provided uh, through that model hook is being iterated over and now gives me a list of articles. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, this is really kind of, what, like, this is so simple, like this is so crummy. Well, what's powerful here is that I wanna generalize this template to be usable with all different content entities, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually copy this template and I'm gonna put it over here, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, let's give it a title. And I'll explain very shortly what this means when I say title in these double curly braces. Finally, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, you know, this has to be a bit more generic. So I'm gonna say, let me call it entities, an entity, and I'll show you exactly what's going on here, right? Oops, entity. Now, what you'll see is that when I actually go to my, back to my article template, I'm going to actually invoke this component. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm going to refer to it in much the same way that you would refer to an HTML custom element. Meaning, I'm gonna say, give me an entity list and I'm gonna provide it some arguments. I'm gonna say title, list of articles, and I'm gonna say entities equals model. Now what I'm doing here is that within this invocation of this component, I'm actually providing information to it. So if I go back to the screen, you'll see that entities is actually referring back to the argument that I provided here. Title is also referring back to the argument that I provided here. And this is the way that I've been able to genericize this. And what'll happen is when I actually refresh this, nothing changes. Because what I've done is I've just uh, abstracted out um, that component. And so what I can do now actually is I can do some really cool stuff, right? What I can do is I can generate a couple new nodes. But just before that, let me go ahead and make this a little bit more pretty. You know, we wanna make sure that there's a little bit more uh, of stuff that you can see here. So I'm just gonna uh, add a couple of things just for us. Just so it, it, you know, it's a little bit better. And um, you know, what'll happen is this'll be providing more of an application shell for us. And I wanna provide a navigation bar as well. So the, the, the link to uh, uh, handlebars um, element is something that you can use uh, very easily. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and you know, shell out my application like this. I'm gonna say I wanna have links to not only articles, but I wanna have links to pages too, you know, the basic page content type in Drupal. So let's say pages. And then I'm also gonna get a list of users. Now, the thing is, what's important to realize is that we haven't actually created these routes yet. So when I try to click on these links, it's gonna give me an error. But what I can do now, right, is if, oops, I'm sorry, I just opened up Safari. Okay, good, all right. Um, now when I go back to the home page, you'll see, I should have, let's see here. I should be getting here. So I'm just gonna show you very quickly what Ember Inspector looks like. Um, what you can see here is there's some really cool uh, and nice little features. Um, you can do things like you know track your promises. Let me see if I can zoom in on this actually. There we go. Um, you can have a view tree. You've got your routes all recorded there. You can have all of your data. You can browse through your data. Um, you can also track all of your promises um, and then also do things like performance tracking as well. Um, 
so that's very cool. Now, one of the things that um, I want to make sure to do now is to create some routes, right? Because we want to make sure that there's uh, you know, some availability on these routes. And also make sure to provide the outlet for those, tests, those templates that are nested within. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly generate a couple of routes here. I'm going to say ember generate route pages, right, to match the route, the, the link that we've just added. And so ember's going to give me that new route. I'm going to say give me some user, uh, a page for the users as well, right? And what will happen now is you'll see that I've got some new handlebars templates. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take this, right? I'm going to take all of this and I'm just going to put it uh, over here. And instead of saying outlet, because there's no further templates that are lower, right? I'm going to say, OK, let me make these pages, this list of pages here, using that same component. And the same thing with the users as well. Right. Now, what's going to happen next is uh, I need to provide some data now as well. Right. So I really wish there was a way to, to zoom in on this left side here. Oh, gosh, that's really bad. Um, but what will happen is if I go to my routes, right, what you'll remember is back in my article route, right, you'll see that I've got my three, uh, those three items there. I'm just going to take this same stuff and I'm going to go ahead and go to my already generated, my pre-generated uh, route and replace these model hooks with something different, right? So I've got that. Now let me do the same thing with users. And you can see how this becomes very quick. You know, this kind of development is actually very easy and very quick. Now, if I go ahead and boot up my server again, what you'll see is I've got my um, Ember application here. And what'll happen is if I zoom out just a little bit, when I click on articles, there's my three articles. When I click on pages, there's my three pages. And when I click on users, there's my three users. Now, the thing that's important to keep in mind here is all of this is happening dynamically, right? The route in the top URL bar is changing to slash articles, slash pages, and slash users automatically. And these, pa these changes in the DOM are also happening uh, dynamically, which means that there is never a full page refresh happening uh, while I'm doing this. So no matter where I click, no matter what I do, I'm never ever getting a full page refresh, right? Okay, so that's cool. But what's next? You know, what's, what's missing? Well, now we got to get some data in there, right? And we got to get some real data because this dummy data isn't really helpful. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and generate a model. And as you can see, Ember CLI does a lot of generation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say model node hyphen hyphen page. And you're probably wondering, what exactly do you mean by node hyphen hyphen page? Well, if you go back, if you remember, if we go back all the way to um, the JSON output, what you right, might remember here is that we have a type that's declared with each resource. And this type is actually what the JSON API adapter, which I'll cover shortly in Ember, uses to know what type of data it's dealing with in the model. And so what'll happen is, when I create, when I generate these three uh, models, right, I'm going to go ahead and create one for article. So this is entity type and bundle. <laughs> now I've got that. And then finally one for users. And one note to make about users is that users don't have bundles. And uh, in the JSON API module in Drupal 8, currently, what you do is you just use um, the same entity type name when you're referring to the bundle as well. All right. So now if I open up my models, Folder, you'll see I've got some, you know, three different models here. Now, if I go back to this JSON output again, what you might notice is you might notice this uh, attributes section here, and I might want to get some data out of there that I want to display in my Ember application, like things like the node ID, maybe the UUID, definitely the title for sure, and maybe the change timestamp, right, and perhaps the body. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scaffold this out within my model. I'm going to go back to my articles model, uh, sorry, my uh, articles route, right? And uh, I'm going to think about what exactly is the data that I want. Now, if I go to my 
article model, and once again, it's been generated for me in this nice modular format. What I can do is, within here, I can say, well, what I want is I want the node ID. I want the UUID. I want the title. I want the created timestamp. And finally, I want the body. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, okay, well, what about the fact that if you go back, the value of the body is actually nested within? What JSON API adapter in uh, Ember does is really smart. It actually goes ahead and goes down into the tree and digs up all of those uh, nested attributes and actually makes them available to you automatically. Now, you might be wondering what this dot ATTR method is. Um, the ATTR method is helpful for you if you want to you know, potentially serialize something differently. So let's say you have an NID, but you actually want that to be a string instead of an integer or you know, vice versa. Then you can put in here a string and it'll, and it'll be converted into a string. So that's one use for this. And there are, if you check the documentation on Ember, you'll, you'll, you'll still see this actually uh, take, take form. Now I'm going to go ahead and copy this over to my uh, page as well. Oops. So I've got my uh, page now. Now the users, however, are going to be a little different, right? Now if I go back and I go ahead and look up the correct um, uh, endpoint, the correct resource here, you'll see that there's different information, right? I don't have a body. I have my, um, you know, I have all of my information here. Um, I've got also my hashed password here um, and my email. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just get the UID. And once again, this is very easy, you know, because I'm going to get the UUID as well. I'm going to go ahead and get the name of the user. And I'm going to get the email of the user. Now, oops. Now, what's going to happen now is we've got some models, right? But this doesn't help because right now this model is not able to see what's on the Drupal side. So we need to connect these models to Drupal. And Ember has a concept called an adapter. And what an adapter basically is, is a, um, an abstraction that helps you make uh, XHRs, XML HTTP requests, against the back end of your choice. And there's different kinds of adapters available. There's a REST adapter that's more generic. And of course, there's the default adapter, which is the JSON API adapter. Now, once again, I'm going to generate an adapter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say, give me an adapter that's going to just stretch across my entire application rather than just a single portion. Because you can actually differentiate uh, adapters based on uh, what route, what, you know, what component. It's very flexible. But for the purposes of this, I'm going to go ahead and just stick with one single adapter for my entire application. Now, what's going to happen here is if I open that up, you'll see that, once again, I've got a generated modular output here, which is really nice. And the JSON API adapter within Ember Data actually gives you some options that you can set. One of them, for instance, is the host. So this is where we finally connect our Drupal backend to our Ember frontend. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say that this is the host, and the namespace is under API. Now, if I save this, right, what will happen is you'll see that there's stuff happening. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll see that this is now connected. But when I actually go back and refresh, I'm still going to get the same data that you see here. And I'll explain why. Right? So if I refresh here and I refresh the users page, I'm still getting the same ones. Right? There's something missing, and that's the, module, the, the model hook. I haven't actually gone back into my routes and changed this model hook. Right? What I need to do is I need to access the data store, which in turn accesses the adapter uh, in Ember. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to say return this.get from the store in Ember. I'm going to get, just get all of the data of this type. And what I'm doing here is I'm specifically looking for those entities that have this type. And what will happen is you'll see that all of these things are working, right? And then I'll go over to pages and do the same thing. So I'll go over here and say find all of my page. And then finally, I'll go to my users and do the same thing there. And you can see how this is something that you can repeat pretty easily. All right. Now, we should be good to go, right? 
I think we're good to go. I think, I think, I think we're good, right? I think we're good, right? Oh, well, well, maybe not, huh? Well, oh, oh no, there's something missing. Well, believe it or not, the problem here is that Ember actually assumes almost too much. Ember assumes that you want a particular kind uh, of path that your JSON API is built in a particular way. So if you look here, you can see that it's assuming that my user, user, uh, type and bundle pair is actually the name of the resource and actually the way that you get to it. And what's really funny is that if I go back to my recent log here and I refresh the page, what you'll see is there's actually a 404 error because Ember has assumed too much. So there's a problem here. Our app isn't working. We have the models, we have everything in place, but our app's not working. So what we have to do is we actually have to customize our adapter. And what that does is it helps us to connect much more seamlessly with our Drupal site. Now the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna go back to my adapter, and as you can see, there's really limited options. I've got the host, I've got the namespace, but nothing else. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and actually change the way that the type information gets passed on to the backend in terms of the request. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, path for type, which is a property that helps you uh, override some of these things. And I've got the type argument that comes in. So this is the user dash dash user node dash dash type. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna go ahead and actually do a little bit of quick changing around of these things. So I'm gonna use the let keyword, which is a new uh, uh, keyword in ES6. And the difference between var and let is that var, uh, let will actually limit, limit it limit the scope of that variable to the, blocks, to the um, uh, block uh, that it's in, which means that it's scoped tightly and uh, won't escape, um, whereas var is just um, scoped to the surrounding function. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and do a detection of this type. And I'm gonna say, hey, if it's user, hyphen hyphen user, well, the thing is, right, what actually needs to happen is that if I go back to my path and I look at where this is coming from, it's user slash user. It's not user dash dash user, it's user slash user, right? So I'm gonna do a little bit of rewriting here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, well if that's the case, let me go ahead and say entity type instead is gonna be user slash user, right? Do the same thing with um, node page. Node slash page. And you'll, and you'll see this if you actually look at the, um, and I'm gonna actually go ahead and just make this a default. Now, okay, so that's all good. That's all good to go. And the thing that's missing now is to go ahead and return the correct path. Now, one thing that you might have noticed is that uh, Drupal 8's REST uses a query parameter string um, to dictate the format. Unfortunately, Ember doesn't necessarily know that, right? And this is one of the cases where we have to bring Drupal and Ember closer together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually uh, um, uh, uh, append this uh, to, the end of the, uh, to the end of the string. And so the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna say, well, when you actually return the correct type that the, that the adapter's gonna use to fetch this information, I'm gonna go ahead and get the entity type, which is one of these things, plus the format that we're using here, right? Now, that's our adapter. We've customized it to recognize Drupal. And what'll happen is, if I go ahead and make sure that this is now back to normal, you'll see that I now have a nice list of all my users. I've got my uh, UUID showing up. I've got you know, all of these things showing up. Now you might be wondering, why, is it look, you know, why does it look so weird? Well, the reason why it looks so weird is because we haven't actually accessed any of the attributes within. And that's our next step. So as you can see, you know, we've got data coming in now. And this data is coming from Drupal. Pretty awesome, right? That's pretty cool. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my templates and I'm gonna go ahead and replace these templates with things that are actually going to work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my uh, components, and, or to, sorry, to my uh, templates here, and I'm gonna replace this component with this, which is a list of articles, right? I'm gonna say, go through and iterate over the model, 
right? Which was which we declared in that model hook, and uh, make it make the name of this of each iteration article. I'm going to say give me the article title, and those of you who have worked with Twig might be seeing some familiar stuff here. I'm going to say give me the node ID. Oops. I'm going to say give me the UID. Give me the created timestamp. And finally, go ahead and give me the body. Now remember what I said earlier about the fact that the value of the body is nested within the body, right? Well, we can just do that. And Ember already knows what to do. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you what this looks like right now. And if I go ahead and refresh, you can see I've got a nice list of all of my articles that have been exposed through Drupal and have been ingested by Ember. And I can do the same exact thing, right, when it comes to my other templates here. So I can do the same thing with pages, right? So I say pages, page, 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 page. And then also for users. But users obviously is a little different, right? Because we decided to actually use name instead, and we're actually going to be calling it, we're actually going to be using UUID. We're going to be using, um, oh, sorry, we're going to be using UUID here, user here, and then we're going to be using uh, the email, right? All right, and nothing else. Now, what you'll see is when I actually go back and I've rewritten my templates, oh, I missed one thing, which is this. There we go. Now, nice, right? Let me zoom out just one little step here so you can see. Now, if I go through and I look, I've got every single user recorded. I've got every single page from my Drupal site now available. I've got every single article from my Drupal site coming out into my Ember application. So that's awesome, right? It's pretty cool. Now. Because we only have nine minutes left, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to the uh, creation uh, aspect just because uh, you know, I think that it's important that I save some time for questions. Um, but what I will do is in the slides at the end, um, and all of this information, by the way, is recorded in the slides, I'm going to have uh, all of that information there. But what I want to do is I want to sort of take a step back. You know, I've shown you some very nitty gritty stuff. And I've shown you just a little bit of how you can do CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. Uh, we didn't get to creation, but um, you know, you'll see that uh, uh, once the slides are up. I want to actually get a little bit into the big picture here. right? Why is this model so compelling? Right? Why are people so enamored with JavaScript frameworks? And why is it that we have you know, you know, that these kinds of interactions here are very compelling? Right? And you'll notice that I didn't style it. Um, but if I had styled it, you'll see that it's a very nice, fluid, seamless experience. So there's a blog post that Dries recently wrote um, called Can Drupal Outdo Native Applications? And it's a very interesting blog post, in my opinion, because it really digs into what do we want Drupal to be? What do we want the user experience of Drupal to look like? And if you've been following along with any of the sort of presentations I've given lately or, or more of the decoupled talks I've given, you'll know that I've been talking a lot about uh, a how our front end and our back end uh, um, you know, can work together in a way that may not be traditional, may not be monolithic. One of the things that uh, we saw recently is the, uh, at DrupalCon New Orleans, um, uh, Ed Faulkner, who's one of the core maintainers of the Ember framework, visited DrupalCon and gave a presentation about how we can actually make Drupal more native and actually make Drupal and Ember work in tandem to provide a really interesting user experience. What you're seeing here is Drupal.com, which is our you know, sort, of flagship, you know, sort of our commercial site. And what it, you know, this is using the Liquid Fire plugin in Ember. And what you'll notice is that the route here is changing. The path in the URL bar is changing. But there's no full page refresh. right? And when you click on the thumbnail here for Red Hat, it actually takes you to that page in a very seamless animation, which isn't currently possible in Drupal. What's more? Well, there's also this idea of editorial experiences, which have a very similar user experience as well. This is the card stack editor, which is something that uh, Ed has been working on for uh, a, a client that is using Drupal on the back end, 
but solely Ember on the front end. What's unique about this approach is that this is Ember fully decoupled from Drupal, which means that there's no Drupal front end uh, logic happening here. No Twig, no PHP template, none of that. It's all handlebars, it's all Ember. And what you'll notice here is that this editorial interface that they've written, which uses JSON API, by the way, and connects with Drupal and makes all of these uh, 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 interactions with Drupal, it's something that's fully integrated into the context and into the preview of the site. Now, the difference here is that the editorial interface and the site are both rendered in Ember. And they're also both rendered together here. So as we think about some of these outside-in improvements that have been happening in Drupal, and we think about some of the you know, new improvements that have been happening, you know, one of the things that I've always thought about is, is uh, how quickly can we advance our user experience? And one of the ways that we can, just to go back to the presentation here, is through what's called inversion of control. Inversion of control is a very important concept in which rather than the server side dictating application state, right? Early in the 90s, mid 90s, you know, even up to the early 2000s, all application state was driven through full page refreshes, right? You would fetch a new page from the server and that would be the new state of your application. With the JavaScript renaissance, that's really changed and that paradigm has been completely overturned. What we now see is inversion of control where the client side actually controls all of the state. The client side is what initiates all of the actions and the client side is what actually manages all the communication with the server. So I want to end here briefly with uh, just a little bit of, of my own perspective. And uh, you know, some of you may have heard of, of, of uh, you know, the work I've been doing around JavaScript frameworks and Drupal. Uh, some of you might have also heard of um, some of the debate that's been going on about Node.js. You know, our, our world is changing very quickly. And one of the things that uh, we've seen in Drupal 8 is a wholesale revolution in the back end. Uh, Symphony, Composer, these things are, are, are really amazing for the future of Drupal. What we haven't really seen is a concomitant uh, revolution in the front end. We're still using our Ajax framework that we've had for years. We're still using our behavior system that we've had for years. We're still using Backbone, which we've had for, for, for quite some time. And we're still using jQuery. And if you're thinking to yourself, how can I make these same interactions happen in a Drupal site? The short answer is, it's not so easy. And what I'm about to say is going to be a bit controversial. But in my opinion, I believe that the way that we can move Drupal forward in terms of attracting new developers, improving our user experience to a, a phenomenal degree, and improving our developer experience as well on the front end. Because, I mean, how many of us have used the Ajax framework in Drupal and the behavior system, right? It, it, it can be kind of a pain, right? Right? I mean... <laughs> So as you can see, the developer experience of Ember is great, right? But one of the things that you might have noticed is that Ember is really well suited to these kind of full-scale applications, these full-page applications, right? Rather than sort of small components on the front end. It's my opinion that uh, what kind of future I would like to see for Drupal is a future where Drupal is decoupled out of the box. It's a future where you have the back end of Drupal managing all of the data, the exposure of that data, you have a great API for CMS. And on the front end, you have a very powerful, very powerful uh, UI, admin UI, and end user experience coupled together. How many people have heard of WordPress Calypso? So WordPress Calypso is a fully decoupled, single page React application that was made by WordPress uh, to improve their user experience uh, uh, in a very interesting way. But I think that uh, you know, in this case, uh, the WordPress, uh, the automatic folks, they've done a really good job uh, with Calypso. It's very impressive. But they've made a really big miscalculation. If you open up WordPress Calypso and you begin to interact with it, what you'll notice is that it's just another series of forms. It's just another series of fields. You know, you're not actually able to get the preview and the and the context because that's all still in WordPress PHP land. The difference with Cardstack Editor and the difference with the approach that I'm recommending to you guys all today is that if we can pair the admin UI with the uh, end user experience, what the end user sees, and we provide that context to the user, provide those outside and improvements in a way that makes a lot of sense, that will actually advance things very rapidly 
and the user experience will be great. Because we, know, we all know clients, we all know editors who want to be able to see their headlines as they're typing them in the context of the site, as they're typing it into the field. And that's something that we can't necessarily do today. That's something that Outside In points toward. And I just want to end here with one brief uh, a comment, you know, which is that uh, someone said to me, uh, you know, I was at MidCamp last year and I had a conversation about some of these things, some of these issues. And um, you know, I, I, I mentioned that I had a lot of qualms about this. You know, there's a lot of issues here. If we decouple Drupal out of the box, if we have a JavaScript front end and a Drupal back end, we have two separate stacks. We have Node.js, we have LAMP, we have all sorts of problems. And we also have a community which thrives on this you know, very close relationship between the front end and the back end. And he said something very interesting to me, which I've you know, kept in mind up to this day, and I've, and I've still really thought about a lot, which is Drupal isn't a software project. Drupal isn't a single software project. Drupal is a community. Drupal is you know, an ecosystem. And it's my conviction, and it's my job over the next uh, you know, uh, year or so to convince all of you that we can still be Drupal even with Ember on the front and Node.js on the, uh, 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 powering that UI. We can still be Drupal with just an API first repository on the back end and in PHP and in a LAMP stack. We can be all of that and still call that Drupal. And what will happen is we'll get a whole new interesting set of ideas, a whole new interesting set of, of uh, uh, interesting get off the island techniques that we can think about. And I think that that's the way that will guarantee a really long term and exciting, amazing future for Drupal. Thank you. I think I have time for maybe a couple of questions. Yes. And there's a mic over here, by the way, as well, if you'd like to. But I'll also repeat. Yep, sure. So I, I asked this a couple of years ago, and I wanted to see somebody doing Angular and stuff like that. And I go, where do we stand with the SEO? It, it all looks great, and I really want to use it. But there's so much digging I have to do, and there's so much kind of like fluff that I have to put back then. I have to run the front end to kind of cache everything so that search engines can kind of like deal with this stuff. Where, where do we stand at the moment with that kind of doing? Sure, that's a great question. So the question was, um, you know, where is SEO right now? Um, you know, these client-side libraries are really great uh, for those interactions and, 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 and you know, but, but how is, you know, um, SEO is a big issue. So um, what's the current state? The, um, you know, right now, SEO uh, is actually in a very interesting state when it comes to JavaScript because in the past, uh, about two or three years ago, you used to have uh, services such as prerender.io, which would spit out a server-side pre-rendered version of your page uh, or, your, uh, you know, of your site for indexing by search engines. Um, in the last 12 to 18 months, um, I'm not sure exactly what the time frame was, but Google recently announced that um, they will execute JavaScript on all pages that they come across while indexing, which means that even if you have a page that is entirely driven by JavaScript, um, the, Google, while it's indexing uh, your site, will access all of that content because it will execute that JavaScript before actually uh, uh, crawling. So. Um, Well, so there's, there's a couple of uh, solutions. Well, there's, there's, there's one you know, big answer to that question, and that is that um, you know, Ember uh, and all of the other major JavaScript frameworks have server-side pre-rendering available. Ember has Fastboot. Um, Angular has uh, you know, that built in as well. Uh, React obviously has, um, uh, I, the name escapes me right now, but uh, React also has a pre-rendering uh, 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 service as well. What that means is that you can mitigate that um, you know, even if, let's say, DuckDuckGo or Yahoo or, or what have you doesn't actually execute JavaScript, it will actually give you that initial server-side render such that you're not going you're, you're, you're to have a blank page when you search for that uh, term. Now, um, you know, on the other side of it, you know, I think that it's still kind of in flux. You know, um, the, Google has really bought into, I would say, the JavaScript execution pattern of indexing. Um, I'm not really aware of you know, what's happening on the other search engines, um, but my, my sort of 
you know, initial conviction right now is that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in the, you know, in the notion that um, pretty much it will not be uh, um, something that um, uh, uh, is a problem in the near future. Yes. Two questions. Uh, would you please share the code as well, not only the yes. slides but also the code? Yes, absolutely. I'll have a, um, a repository available on my GitHub account. Perfect. Thanks. Yep. Uh, second question is, uh, what is your um, experience with, with this technology related to accessibility, for example, screen readers? Sure. It's a great question. Um, so accessibility is a major concern. I actually, uh, um, you know, I come from a UX background uh, originally, um, and one of my passions has long been accessibility. So. Um, what I will say about uh, accessibility is that all of the major frameworks, and I'm going to talk generally about all these frameworks, all of them actually do have uh, uh, um, solutions for accessibility. Um, Angular, for instance, has uh, um, uh, the ability to uh, you know, uh, declare um, uh, different uh, uh, versions of content, for example. Uh, I know that Ember and React also have the same within their ecosystem. The um, Interesting thing about this, though, is that, honestly, accessibility has to come from the ground up, in my opinion. Um, accessibility is something that's not, that you don't get for free, right? Drupal, with Drupal, you do get it for free, but that's only because of years upon years of, of this, you know, phenomenal experience that we've had, phenomenal uh, uh, advocates of accessibility that we've had in the community. But, um, you know, these JavaScript frameworks are still a little bit immature in that realm. But I think, more importantly, um, you know, a lot of the people that you see building these applications aren't necessarily the best at writing markup. And, um, you know, obviously this uh, uh, presentation that I gave and the code that I've written, you know, is, is very rough and is not, you know, nothing that I would say would pass the WCAG uh, guidelines by any means. But what I think is more important is actually a paradigm shift in how we think about markup. Um, I, you know, one of my biggest fears about the JavaScript Renaissance and the way things have been moving is that we're entering a period of another Wild West, you know, like just like the browser wars, where we had all sorts of crazy markup. You know, we were using really disgusting CSS properties and really disgusting ways of uh, doing layout. Um, I think that we're almost we're close to entering that ag once again, because a lot of these people that I, you know, that are building these applications don't necessarily have a good grasp on uh, alt tags. For instance, which is you know, mm -hmm. which is really obvious, or you know, don't have those kinds of problems. However, what I will say is that every framework, if you go to the sites of all the frameworks, they do have an entire section dedicated in their documentation to accessibility and making sure that tab index still works, uh, making sure that um, you know screen readers can still read content. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people who are working on that. One of my uh, 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 friends actually is at Facebook um, working on accessibility and and has done work on React. So. Um, I think that's something that is evolving, but is coming okay. very well. Yep. Uh, hello. Yeah, just a kind of few points that lead on. One sure. is, um, like you say, with components abstracted, you get the same with content, images, all kinds of things. The way we're working at the moment, inline editing, inline dashboards don't work so well because you edit one thing, it will change, have a ripple effect throughout the site. Mm -hmm. And I guess that kind of leads on to, there are quite a lot of Drupal modules, panels out there. As Dries showed yesterday, the sidebar, whatever you call it. The settings tray. The settings tray. <laughs> um, all of which are kind of moving in this direction, but you kind of have a lot of editors still who will need a full admin separated UI. Yeah. And the idea of building that completely in Ember as well would be Quite a challenge, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. And, and and by the way, this is this is meant to be. This is like what I just you know expressed is long term. I mean, I'm not saying that we're gonna that we should do this in the next six months. <laughs> but um, that's a really good point. And I think what's important to keep in mind is that we have different content needs, right? We have different places that content is going to different touch points. We have uh, IoT applications, we have native mobile applications, we have um, uh, Roku applications, set-top boxes, where you don't even have access to a visual interface, right? So in my, you know, my personal opinion is that you should have both. You should have both the option to, if you're gonna build a web, you know, a web experience for your end user, then yes, absolutely, you can use um, that settings tray. But you should also have the option not to, because there are so many other experiences of content which aren't going to have that benefit of that in-context 
in preview advantage. So um, you know that's 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 my thinking around the topic. I think that um, you know Drupal has always prided itself on flexibility. Drupal has always prided itself on versatility, um, and I think that you know discarding, let's say, the paradigm that we've been working with all the way up until now is is a is a is a big mistake. Right? We have to have both. So um, yes. So the question was, is there a Drupal Ember boilerplate? Um, so uh, you know, I've noticed actually that there are fewer people in the Drupal community who played around with Ember than with Angular and React. Um, there is one uh, GitHub project that I can highlight right now because it's on my, it's, it's it's up here right now. Um, Ed Faulkner, um, uh, in, in, the, in the process of writing this uh, presentation that you saw at New Orleans, has written this uh, you know sort of module for Drupal, which will interpolate Ember into your module. Right, or, or sorry, into your Drupal site. Um, what I haven't seen so much of actually is Ember Drupal boilerplates. Um, a lot of the ones I've seen are reliant on Ember 1.0 rather than 2.0, which is the current version of Ember. Um, but it's my hope that with this uh, code that I'm going to put up, that'll be a good start. Um, because I think what's now missing is, is the fully decoupled element. You know, we've got uh, a great module that you can use thanks to Ed for progressive decoupling. And what about for those fully decoupled experiences? So, anyways, um, so I just want to you know say one last thing, which is that you know I think that uh, um, user experience is a field that's moving very rapidly, and um, you know it's it's my firm belief that in the next uh, in the next um, twelve months, the next twelve to twenty four months, um, it's going to be kind of anathema. It's going to be kind of ridiculous uh, for good user experience to have full page refreshes. And that's really where this stuff comes in. And I highly encourage you to, to, to think about these issues. Um, if you'd like to email me and uh, get in touch, I'm more than happy to talk about these issues and think about solutions moving forward. Um, and uh, together, we can make sure that Drupal uh, is a great UX, a great DX, a great everything X uh, for the next 20, 50, 100, 200 years. <laughs> Thank you.